Thanks, Arith. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you for having me here. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, graph classifiers via short cycle decompositions. Uh, this is uh, based on two papers, one at Fox last year and Soda this year, uh, with a number of co-authors. So Timothy Chu, Junjing Wang, the students at CMU, Yu Gao, uh, and Saurabh Solani, students of Richard Peng at Georgia Tech. And uh, the second paper is with two undergrads, Yang Liu, who's now at Stanford, and Zijun, who's here now at Portaloo. The undergrads at Toronto? Uh, uh, Zijun was an undergrad at Toronto. Uh, Yang, Richard put me in touch with Yang, and then now he's gone to do grad school. Good, so uh, this talk will be about a new graph decomposition. Uh, so I'll tell you about it, uh, short cycle decomposition. I'll also tell you about the almost linear time algorithm to find one. And we'll see several applications of this decomposition to graph specification. Uh, we'll use it to cr construct degree preserving specifiers, resistance specifiers, spectral sketches, then uh, Eulerian graph specification, effective resistances, determinants. We won't talk about all of these. Uh, given the amount of time, we'll, I'll focus on telling you about the decomposition and how to construct it, and some simple applications, uh, typically the first half here. Good, so let me begin. Uh, here's uh, like a rough outline what I'll talk about. I'll tell you, what, we'll begin with the story of grass classifiers. All of us have heard of grass classifiers here? Okay, excellent. Uh, we have a few. Well, I mean, I saw I saw heads nodding in the other direction, so I'm so then we can take some good time to make sure we are all on the same page. We'll start with that. I'll introduce the decomposition, give you simple applications, and then we'll finally talk about how to construct these uh, decompositions fast. Okay, so let's begin with what I think is a very fascinating. Uh, area in spectral graph theory that kind of came a lot more from an algorithmic perspective. Uh, it's, it's kind of now people might consider it old, beginning in late 90s and early 2000s. So the story begins, uh, uh, at least the aspects I consider relevant here, with Bengtsur and Karger in 96. They defined a notion of cut sparsifiers, cut sparsifiers for a graph. So say you are given a graph G, right? Undirected, weighted, let's say. And it has, for notation, I'll use N for no, number of nodes, vertices, and M for the number of edges. So I want to say that H is a sparsifier of G. If H is a graph on the same set of vertices, identically the same set of vertices, and it satisfies the following property, that if you look at any vertex cut in the vertex, so, so think of this as a bipartition of the vertices. You can look at the same bipartition in H, right? H is a graph on the same set of vertices. If you look at this for any partition of the vertices, then the cut in the graph G, by that I mean the sum of the weights of the edges that are going from one side to the other, right? That cut in G is approximately equal to the cut in H. And what is approximately equal? Multiplicatively up to 1 plus epsilon. Right? If this holds for all vertex cuts in the graph, then that's a cut specifier. Ah, good. So, so think of the weights, the edges as weighted, non negative weights. And the cut is the sum of the weights of the edges going across. Right? So if they are. You're allowed to change the weights. So. You're allowed to change the weights for the edges. Right? And I'm saying that H is a sparsifier. If you look at the sum of the weights crossing here and the sum of the weights crossing here, they are within 1 plus epsilon for every, every vertex cut. Sorry, every bipartition of the vertices. Good, is that definition clear? Because we had a few people who had not seen this before. Ah, good. The definition doesn't need it to be sparse, but we'll talk of going, we'll typically talk of going from a dense graph G to a sparser graph H, right? And that's why it's called specification. 
Uh, it's not obvious. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Let me show you an easy example. Yeah, you want it for the exponential even like two to the n cuts, right? But the number of entries which are squared. N uh, need not be. So let me show you an let me show you a very easy example to think of. Take two cliques, right? Uh, disjointed and then add a single edge between them. Right? In order to preserve this edge, this cut, you have to sample this edge. Right, so the probabilities have to depend on the structure of the graph, on the specific edge you sample. So then you can do random sampling, right? But once you have small cuts, okay. then you have to start worrying about how do the edges behave. No, right? So no great questions to get on, uh, right? So it's not obvious. In fact, in, right? I think a priori it's not even obvious that there exist sparse. Epsilon cuts sparse bars. Right, sparse. sparse. Right. You use the word sparse here, so now it's not the same. Anymore. Uh, where did I use this? Instead of epsilon cut across the mean. Okay. Sorry. Right, uh, but I will almost always talk of it as being sparse. Right? Uh, sorry. Good. So Beggs and Carger showed something that was definitely surprising to people at first. Um, that any graph G, any weighted graph G, however dense it is, it has an epsilon cut sparse phi with n log n over epsilon squared edges. And are you allowed to add edges that weren't present in G? Ah, good. So by definition, you are allowed, but their construction was actually special that every edge in H was an edge from G, but with a different weight, potentially a different weight. Right? So, the, the definition does not require it to be a subgraph, but everything, every construction I will show today will actually be a subgraph at least in support, but not weight wise, like the weights could be larger in H. Okay? Uh, we have a lot of time, so I am happy to take questions. Epsilon is too small, right? uh, sure, if you start plugging in epsilon as 1 over n, okay. yeah, then it is a lot, lot many so more edges. Uh, no, but epsilon could be say polynomially small, but not too small, right? It's still a non-trivial question to ask, and it, in fact, it will be epsilon being smallish will become important for us, right? Let's say one over n to the n to the one over ten, uh, n to the minus one over ten, right? So, so polynomially small, but yeah, it's not like one over n. Okay. Good. Are we all on the same page, confident with this definition? Right. So this, uh, so they defined this notion. They gave an algorithm to construct cut sparsifiers and actually applied it to give faster algorithms for max flow than, uh, for approximating max flow than were known in that age. Right. So this is back in '96. Uh, this notion was generalized uh, in the work of Spielman and Tang, 2004, uh, to a notion called spectral graph sparsifiers. Okay. How do we define spectral graph sparsifiers? Uh, in order to do that, I need to define the graph Laplacian. Okay. What is the graph Laplacian? Here's the classic definition. So it's a matrix. It's an n by n matrix, the vertex, vertex set by vertex set. The classic definition is you take the diagonal matrix of degrees, right, weighted degrees, and you subtract from it the weighted adjacency matrix, the symmetric weighted adjacency matrix. Right? This is the classic definition of a graph Laplacian. But I like the following definition more. It is a functional definition. So, the graph Laplacian of a graph G is the unique symmetric n by n matrix such that if I picked any vector in R to the n, right? so you have one coordinate for every vertex, and you look at the quadratic form x transpose Lx, that can be rewritten as the following sum, sum over the edges of the graph Ij. Weight of the edge ij multiplied by xi minus xj squared, where xi and xj are the values of the vector x at the endpoints of the edge ij. Right? So, so the Laplacian is the unique n by n symmetric matrix that gives you this quadratic form. Okay, now let's make an easy observation. 
that if x, if I pick x to be the indicator vector of a subset of vertices s, then exactly those edges will give you non-zero here and will give you 1 only if the edge crosses from s to s complement. Right? Otherwise, it is either 1 minus 1 or 0 minus 0. The only ones that will give you non-zero is 1 minus 0, where one vertex is on one side of the cut, the other vertex is on the other side. Right? So, the quadratic form gives you exactly the value of the cut in the graph given by the in this vertex at s. Right? Good. So, here is the definition of a spectral sparsifier. So, we will say h is an epsilon spectral sparsifier of g, if for every vector x, the quadratic form of the two Laplacians is approximately equal, up, multiplicatively up to 1 plus epsilon. Right? In particular, Sorry. In particular, this implies that spectral specifiers are cut specifiers, right? Because you can plug in x to be the indicator vectors of the sets, and then they will be multiplicatively equal. Good. So, Spearman and Tang showed that actually any graph G has a spectral specifier with n poly log n over epsilon squared edges, right? n over epsilon squared poly log n, right? As this was improved further, uh, Spielman Shivastva showed that you only need n log n over epsilon squared matching the Bengts or Karger bound. In fact, uh, Batson Spielman Shivastva showed something even stronger n over epsilon squared edges. Right? So, so there exist and you can construct them uh, polynomial time, let us say, uh, spectral specifiers with n over epsilon squared edges. Good. Is the definition and the existence clear to all of us? Okay. Good. So, sorry. That's. Uh, let me tell you how to construct a spectral specifier. Okay. This is not. Uh, so this will be based off of the algorithm given by Spielman Shivasva but it is a, it's a new algorithm, it is a new take on their algorithm and I will do that so that the algorithm that I will talk about later will sort of fall more in line with this one. Okay, so, so what is our goal? You are given a graph G and you want to construct an epsilon spectral sparsifier of this graph. right? So, here is how we are going to do it. Uh, in order, we need to do it using a tool called effective resistance. Right. So, I need to define for you this uh, notion of effective resistance. It is a notion of importance for edges or distance between vertices. So, so, think of two vertices in the graph, vertex i and vertex j. I want to define the effective resistance between i and j. Right. You can actually define it as a physical notion. It is the following. So, I am going to think of the graph as representing an electrical circuit. So, this is my graph. These are my vertices every edge you want to interpret it as an electrical resistance. And how much is the resistance? The resistance is the inverse of the weight. Right? If my weight is 1, it is a resistance of 1 ohm. If the, resist, if the weight is 0, then it is an infinite resistance, right? like an edge through which no current can flow. Right? So, the effect of resistance between two vertices i and j is obtained as follows. I will connect a current source with inflow into i and the current flowing out of j and I want to send one unit of current, well, let us say one ampere, right? one unit of current through this circuit. What is the voltage difference you get across these two vertices i and j? Right? It is a circuit, you are sending in some current and you want to measure the voltage difference that you get. That is exactly the effective resistance between i and j. Okay? It turns out you can write this in an algebraic form uh, as follows. It is a quadratic form with the inverse of the Laplacian. Right? You take the inverse of the Laplacian and you take its quadratic form with this vector, which is indicator of i minus indicator of j. So, it is it's a vector that is 0 everywhere else except with a plus 1 at i and a minus 1 at j. Right? And you take its quadratic form with the inverse of the Laplacian.
questions? Okay, let me show you something. Sorry. Oh, good. Uh, so, so the way to write it is the the way to think about it is actually so if you ignore this way. So this represents your inflow and outflow of the current. Yeah, you have one unit of current going into I, one unit of current coming out of J. Once you multiply it with the inverse of the Laplacian, it actually gives you the vector of voltages. And once you have that vector of voltages, this isolates the voltage difference between I and J, taking inner, pro inner product of this one. So, how do you show that this is the vector of voltages? Well, there are two ways to do it. One is you can write the Kirchhoff's laws uh, for these points. And the other way to derive it for using uh, physical, uh, using basic principles is that we know that the electrical flow is the flow that will send one unit of current while minimizing its energy. Right? And the energy is current square times resistance is summed over the edges. And you write you you differentiate that and you write your Lagrange conditions and it shows you that this is the set of voltages. Because uh, the volt the so it, if you write out uh, the uh, if you write out the Kirchhoff's laws, it says that if I take the vector of voltages and you multiply it with the graph Laplacian, that gives you a vector that is gives you net currents. So, I know what are the net currents, those are plus 1, minus 1 and 0 everywhere else and you get the voltages as applying the inverse. So, I remember, I remember when you did this um, escape probability, so the probability you take a random walk of ah, J, good. you go back to J, before, sorry, yeah. so I before you go to J is exactly the, it the effect. to satisfy the same equation That's with right. respective resistance. That's right. So, the value for this is the same as the particular, anyway, the probability that a random walk goes here and not there seems to me much more easy to understand than some physical laws. Uh, right, that's only because you're familiar with it. Yeah, uh, but know, but I can tell you why that is, appears here. I'm just to, to talk about resistance so much is that what kind of intuition are we gaining from this? If you can tell me it's written, then I'd be happy to. But if it just happens to satisfy the same equation, then why not just talk about um, the equation for because people outside this room might not be so familiar with random works. But let us say, let me show you um, why, if you prefer that definition, that will that will work as well, right. If you prefer the random work definition, I will actually not use so much about this definition in the rest of the talk. I just want to sort of. That was my question. So, where are, we, where are you going to use about resistances and effective resistance? Ah, the the point I am going to use will I will actually not be able to prove. I will, uh, the point I am going to use is that these turn out to be the right pro probabilities to sample the graphs with. Uh, that's something I will not be able to prove here. So yeah, so I just want to introduce this notion for people who have not seen this before. Yeah, it's a, it's, and and if and if you've not seen the definition before, one way to actually see that is, you write the inverse of the Laplacian here, and you can expand it in terms of steps of a random walk, All right? So the so let's say let me make it easy, and if the graph was regular, then it, then I can write the Laplacian as d times identity minus a, and then the inverse of the Laplacian is basically one by d. Uh, sorry d times i minus 1 by d a inverse and then you can expand this power series that is 1 i plus 1 by d a plus 1 by d a d squared a squared and these are actually steps of the random walk right. So, so this gives you a random walk interpretation of the Laplacian inverse and, uh, and just sort of looping into the formula you can actually infer that the probability is exactly equal to the effect of resistance. 
Right. So why are they important? Uh, they they turn out to be important because it turns out to be the right way to actually sample, right probabilities to sample the edges with in order to get a sparse effect. And it turns out, I mean, like if to address your question, it was actually not obvious before Spielman Shavasava that these should turn out to be, even though people had like Bengtsson Kargard had thought of cut probabilities long time ago. Uh, people did not realize uh, for another 10 years that the right probabilities come out of effective resistances. Okay, so, I will also avoid that question, but I will show you how, if you knew this definition, how do you construct a sparse bar. So, here is how we are going to do it. You compute importance scores for every edge. Okay? So, for an edge E, what is my importance score? It is the effective resistance of the pair Ij multiplied by the weight of the edge E. So, if your weights are 0, this is 0. If your weight is 1, it is exactly the effective resistance. Okay? And if you want, if you want some intuition, if you have never seen this, so it is worth thinking about like some two extreme examples. If I take a clique, right, uh, so K n, then just because all the edges are symmetric, you can kind of easily compute that the effective resistance is, is roughly 1 by n for every edge. Okay? And if you take the Dummel graph instead, so here it remains roughly 1 by n for every edge, but the edge crossing the cut gets an effective resistance of 1. Right? So, and this is a measure of importance. Here we know that we can roughly sample from G and P, where P is roughly log n. Uh, here we know that at least for the cut crossing uh, the cliques, we need to keep, we need to always keep it in order to get a sparse effect. Okay, so you compute these important scores. Uh, now I will focus only on the edges that have small important scores. If your important score is median, is larger than the median, then you just keep those edges as it is. Right? Focus on the ones with important scores less than the median. So, it is about half the edges on the graph. For each of these edges, you randomly toss a coin independently. If you get heads, I will keep the edge, but we double the weight of the original graph. If I get tails, I will just throw out the edge. Right? So, you toss a coin, with probability half you keep it and double the weight, with probability half you throw it out. So, I have roughly thrown out one fourth of the edges in the graph. Now, I will repeat this procedure until I am left with about n log n of epsilon squared edges. Okay? And you can show that this gives you an epsilon spectral sparse by with that probability. Okay? So, this is, a, this is inspired by the spielmann shavasva version, but it is not exactly uh, their construction. Uh, so, we sort of proved it and I will use this version of the algorithm for specification in further applications. Good. Are we comfortable with the story so far? Okay. So, now let me introduce to you uh, our new decomposition called short cycle decomposition. Okay. Yeah, please. Can you say something about how to prove that there is open graph in this class before? Ah, okay, good. Uh, so, do you, you you've seen the Spielmann Shurasava proof? Maybe? Okay. So, so let me. Uh, so okay, uh, let me let me start diving down, and you can tell me where where it's seen. So so the key be in so the the technically correct way I know how to look at it is to think of it as a matrix churn of concentration bounds, right? So really, what's happening is so let's observe one very simple thing about this. So think first, you want to think of the Laplacian of the graph that you're sampling. Right? So, we are keeping the same edges, except the weights are either going from w to 2 w or to 0. Right? So, now it is a, it's a, it's a random matrix variable right? uh, for this. For this. Let us just do one iteration, right? like forget the forget multiple. 
So, it is a random matrix variable that we are sampling. Uh, the, the second observation is that I am preserving the expectation of the variable to be the exactly the original Laplacian, right? The weights in expectation are exactly the weights in the original graph, right? Good. The third point actually it turns out is that so if I write uh, so this is the Laplacian of H, it is a sum over your edges, Laplacian of a single edge times this weight in H, this is a random matrix. This is sorry, this is a random scalar, right? This is what we are sampling. I want to show spectral concentration of this of this matrix, right? So now let us go back to scalar matrix concentration bounds. In scalar matrix concentration bounds, what are the properties we typically need? Uh, we need that Right. So, the, we are, there are a few properties that we already have for the matrix concentration. These are all independent variables with the right expectation. The third property that you need in a scalar concentration bounds is that kind of the variance is small, right? And to do the vari like to do that variance computation, you have to first identify that actually we do not, right, what do we want the error to look like? We do not want to say that the error is in terms of its so so this is the random matrix this is your expectation we don't want to say that the error looks like epsilon times the identity matrix we actually want this error to be measured in terms oh you can't see on that end right uh, you want the error to look in terms of the laplacian of the graph good we can sort of rewrite this identity by multiplying both sides by the half of by Laplacian g minus half, and then you want the error to look like your identity matrix, right? Good. Now you can actually apply concentration bounds, and what you want for the concentration bounds is that every sample has small norm, right? Everything you toss your coin for should have small norm, right? And how small? Roughly one over log n. And that's, so, what does a sample look like? A sample looks like the weight of the edge, Laplacian minus half, Laplacian of an edge, Laplacian g minus half. This is my matrix sample. And the norm of this sample exactly turns out to be the effective resistance. Right, so the, the norm of this matrix is exactly the effective resistance, and then effective resistance times the weight gives you the importance score, and we want this to be small. We want the importance score to be small in order to draw a sample. Okay, good. So now we will be able to plug this in easily for our applications. Now that we have some, yes. Ah, very good. All proofs I know that really kind of do independent random sampling only go down to n log n. If you want to get down to n over epsilon squared, it's non trivial. It takes. I mean, the gap is the same as when you draw a graph from G and P, in order for it to be an expander, you need P to be log n over n. At the same time, if I was to draw matchings, I can go down to constant degree, right? It's the same log of a gap, but these proofs do not go down to n over epsilon, right? I will have I will throw in many more polylogs, so I will not worry about uh, logs so much. But the epsilon squared is what I. Sorry. So can you start with n log n edges, and then you want to go down to n. Uh huh. Can you choose a random construction? Uh, you can do a random one, but it cannot be random independent. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, it is a it is sort of correlated in a very in a very intricate manner sort of the first proof sort of picked edges one by one uh, and then they said that oh you can sample a bunch but then you redefine the probabilities you sample a bunch you sample a bunch yeah so they don't look so simple like all of these all of the proofs that go down to n over epsilon squared okay good so let me introduce to you uh, a new decomposition called short cycle decomposition so it's a decomposition it is a partition of the edges of a graph. So, think of an unweighted undirected graph. We are going to partition the edges of the graph 
into edge disjoint short cycles. Okay, edge disjoint short cycles. I'm allowed to discard a small number of leftover edges. Okay, and the key lemma, which I hope is at least one thing we can take away from this talk, is that any unit weighted graph can be partitioned into edge disjoint cycles of length two log n with only two n leftover edges. Unit weighted means just unweighted, unweighted. Uh, right. I'm just specifying it because in the rest of the talk I'm talking about weighted graphs, but think of it as undirected, unweighted. So you can partition the edges into short cycles, all but two n of the edges into cycles of length two log n. Does, yeah, because I'm talking of an unweighted graph for this decomposition. Okay, let me show you this. I hope this is a proof we can all take away. It's a very easy proof. I'll prove it by an algorithm. Uh, so let's do the following: repeatedly remove vertices that have degree one or two. Okay, if there is a vertex of degree one, remove it. If there is still a degree one vertex, keep removing until the graph only has vertices of three or degree three or more remaining. Okay. If you have a graph with vertices of degree 3 or more, it has a short cycle. It has a cycle of length 2 log n. I can show you that if that is not immediate. I will show you that in a second. I claim it has a cycle of length 2 log n. If it has such a cycle, you find it, you remove these edges from the graph, and now you repeat. So every cycle you find is, in a, is of length 2 log n. And how many edges have you discarded? You are only discarding edges at the first step which is at most 2 n edges. Okay, so, why does a degree question, why does a degree 3 graph have a cycle of length 2 log n? The proof is really easy and visual. So, you pick any vertex, you start doing a BFS. Right? If you do not see a cycle, then the graph is going to grow exponentially. Right? You will have 3 vertices, then 2 more at every step, so on. Right? And at some point, either you are going to see a cycle or you are going to explore all of the graph. Right? And actually, you are forced to see a cycle because you, can, you cannot have leaves in this graph. Every vertex has degree 3 or more. And you must find a cycle of length 2 log n. This tree cannot have depth more than log n. Right? That is it. You find a cycle, you remove it, and now you repeat. Right? So, every graph is guaranteed to have a decomposition of its edges into cycles of length 2 log n, all except 2 n edges. Okay, and this is, it is also an algorithm, right? it is a slowish algorithm, m times n, number of edges times n, right? because every time you delete a cycle, you are almost forced to go back and reconstruct your BFS tree. Right? But this existence will actually be already interesting enough for several of our applications. Okay, so let's see some easy applications. So let me start really easy. I will start with something called degree preserving sparsifiers. So, so consider the standard spectral sparsifiers, right? And we said spectral sparsifiers preserve all vertex cuts, right? So in particular, they should preserve cuts that separate just a single vertex. Right? And uh, th what is the weight of the cut that separates just a single vertex? It's just the weighted degree of the vertex. So spectral sparsifiers must preserve weighted degrees up to one plus epsilon. Right? Easy consequence. But can you have spectral sparsifiers that preserve weighted degree exactly? Uh, not obvious by the previous constructions, but using short cycle decompositions, you can show that yes, we can construct spectral sparsifiers that preserve weighted degrees exactly. Okay, and let me show you how. Okay, so I'm going to modify our algorithm pre from previous. Well, S sparsifier and exact numbers. That's right. That's right. Okay, I am going to modify the algorithm for graph specification that I showed you before, and the key component we are going to use is what we call cycle toggling. So, let me show you what is cycle toggling. So, start with an even, sorry about that. Uh, can, uh, actually, hang on. Okay, I will. 
uh, yeah, give me just a second. I will connect this back. I will. Ah, good. Start, turn That's okay. I am done now. It should not be a problem. Good. So, I am going to talk of this key idea called cycle toggling. So, think of one even length cycle in the graph. Okay. If I give you one such cycle, then if you give you one such cycle, I can toggle this in the sense that I will toss a coin. If I get heads, I am going to keep only the even numbered edges in the graph, but with weight double the previous ones okay? and you throw out the odd ones. If you get tails, you do the reverse. You keep the odd ones with double the weight and you throw out the even ones. Okay? So, the key observation is that this procedure always exactly preserves the weighted degree. Right? If I toss one cycle in the graph or a collection of cycles in the graph, with every cycle to toggling, you exactly preserve the weighted degree. Good. So, now I can show you how to use this in order to do degree preserving spa graph specification. Are we assuming that all the weights on the cycle are the same? Yeah, let us assume. Uh -huh. That is how we will do it. Okay. Uh, right. So, so all the weights are the same. Uh, right. So, we can get that by with sort of bucketing the weights uh, okay. and be okay. Oh, you just shift the top to each cycle, right? That is what I thought. Yeah, you can do that. You can do that also. Uh, but what we do is we sort of split um, split one edge into a collection of edges given by its bit representation, mm -hmm. and now you can bucket into powers of two, okay. and on every bucket you can do you can do exact degree preserve. What's another log? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean actually it turns out we don't lose a log in the binary binary no because because the weights are exponentially decreasing so we can. It turns out to be a geometric progression. We don't lose a log, so uh, I will. But I will not worry about logs here. I want to get the ideas across. Uh, so good. So so I think when you miss, so uh, my key step is going to be cycle toggling. That if I toss heads, I'm going to keep only the even weight edges. Throw out the odd ones with double the weight. Like keep the even with double the weight, or do the reverse if I get tails. Okay. So now let's do exact degree preserving specification. Sorry. We won't need to deal with odd cycles. So here's what we do. So first, we will do the important score calculations. You compute the important score. If your important score is more than the median, you just keep those edges as it is, right? So now I'll only talk about the edges with smaller. Now I'm going to bipartition my vertices so that at least half of the low median, uh, low important score edges cross this bipartition, right? We, I can do this greedily, randomly. So, I will ensure that a constant fraction of my edges are in this bipartition. The point is that now you will get even cycles with low import, with all edges being of low importance scores. Okay? On this bipartition, you now do a cycle de short cycle decomposition. Right? right? So, now you have got even short length cycles with all the edges having small importance scores. And for all of these cycles, now you do independent toggling, right? You toss independent coins for each of the cycles and pick either even or odd for each of the cycles. And now you've thrown away a constant fraction of the edges in the graph, right? And yet I've preserved weighted degrees exactly because cycle toggling preserves weighted degrees exactly. Now, I will repeat this procedure until I go down to roughly n log squared and epsilon squared. Okay? And with a, with a similar proof showing that, oh, each random matrix you sample has a small norm because the cycle is, the length of the cycle is small and each of them individually has small importance score, you can show that this gives you a spectral sparsifier that preserves weighted degrees exactly. Yeah. Repeating it a number of times. Right. And the number of times you're repeating probably has to do with how many edges you want. Right? Sure. Uh, but at the end of each occurrence of one, two, three, what's preserved? 
at the, it's a sparsifier. It stays a sparsifier. It stays a sparsifier, and I've cut down the edges by a constant and, fraction. And it stays an epsilon sparsifier. Stays an epsilon sparsifier. Actually, yeah. So if you want to care, if you want to care about logs, then you have to start worrying. But if let me not care about the logs, then at every step you preserve it to be an epsilon sparsifier. And, and so you start with like epsilon over log n, and then you yeah. But it turns out actually you do better because I said because the important score at the beginning is really small, right? Is because it's very small, then you get a geometric progression of errors, and the only error that matters is the last one, uh, right? So, so, right, and all of this. But you really preserve that's a sparsifier with exact weighted degrees, and you cut down the edges by a fraction, right? And then you can repeat. Good. Okay. So now let's talk of something interesting, uh, right? Something. So so let's say I mean degree preserving specifier was not really an open question in some sense that people were like it's an, we found an interesting application. I think it's a cute way to say why it's useful. But here's something that people had been wondering before and what sort of motivated us to write this paper called graphical spectral sketches. So. Let me go back to the story of sparsifiers for a second. So here's our definition again of an epsilon spectral sparsifier. I'm writing it as a little more general. I'm going to say that I'm going to give you a distribution over graphs, right? So the algorithm I showed you was actually random, right? I said, oh, you randomly toss edges, uh, randomly toss coins for the edges. So it produces a distribution over, over the graphs such that with high probability, when you draw a sample from this distribution, for every vector x, you will preserve the quadratic form, right? This was an epsilon spectral sparsifier. And it turns out that this notion is very well understood. Actually, even before it was defined to be a spectral sparsifier, back in 91, uh, Nogalon and uh, Bopanna and, and then Bethson Srinivasa followed up to show that, that this n over epsilon squared is really tight. That every epsilon spectral sparsifier needs n over epsilon squared edges right and in fact to construct a sparsifier of the clique we know that it has to be an expander and we know expanders need n over epsilon squared edges okay so it's really uh, really that uh, the alon bopanna lower bound okay it turned out that this N not only is it in number of edges, you can kind of extend this lower bound to make it really tight. Uh, in the 2016 paper, and all, we and all showed that any data structure, in fact, right, forget a graph, any data structure that can answer all vertex cut queries up to 1 plus minus epsilon needs n over epsilon squared bits. Right? So it's not just a graph restriction, it's just that you cannot answer all cut queries correctly without these many bits. And people have even tightened this log n more. Like we said, we need n over epsilon squared edges, but their weights are kind of different. So you need n, n log n over epsilon squared bits, and that is really tight, right? It's really tight up to that log n. So I mean, you see all of this, and even like the story of graph sparsifiers is probably really understood down to the line. And then there was an interesting paper, uh, like in the same paper that Anthony et al. showed the slow bound. They defined a slightly different notion, and let's uh, take a minute to parse this. They defined a notion of epsilon spectral sketch. Okay, what is an epsilon spectral sketch? So it's a randomized function. Okay, rather it was the previous step was a distribution over graphs. Now I'm saying it's a randomized function such that for every fixed x, let's say hidden from when you are computing f, for every fixed x. With high probability, you preserve, you return the quadratic form. Okay, really note that this is the opposite condition of spectral sparsifier. Spectral sparsifier said, with the, for high probability, for all vectors x, you preserve the quadratic form. Now I'm saying that you take one hidden x, and then I want that for this hidden x with high probability, you should have, you should preserve the quadratic, return to me the quadratic form approximately. So it's a weaker condition than spectral sparsifier. Right? And in particular, this implies that an epsilon spectral specifier is an epsilon graphical spectral sketch. Yes? One minus one over poly. No, 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 no. The function is randomized. It's a randomized function. 
right, over the random bits of the of the function. The the x think of x as one hidden vector that's one fixed vector that's hidden from you when before you compute f. Okay, so this is a weaker notion, but I, at least some of us who had sort of thought of would I had had I been presented with this notion before their paper, I would have thought, yeah, it's probably hard. You can do something better. Just wanted, I just wanted to ask um, randomized function. I mean, you could have said a distribution of the graph. Ah, good. I will get to that point in a second. So they don't manage to do it. They do something weaker. They talk. Of, that's why I'm saying a randomized function. One natural thing would be uh, to have a random graph and compute the Laplacian of the graph. That would be a natural thing to do. They are not able to do. That's what we did before. That's what we did and before. There was a strong conclusion that uh, with hypermobility over this distribution for every x. That's right. Now we could have asked, we want for every x with hypermobility over this distribution. But you're saying. It's I'm even re weakening the requirement of it being a graph. It's not I'm a distribution of a graph uh, over these quadratic. That's right. Laplacian. That's right. Right, it's some data structure that can uh, randomize data structure. Right, so it's a, it's a weaker condition. So, but they showed that actually, like, okay, there and then a follow-up work by Jambalopati Sitford that worked on this. They said that actually you can construct epsilon spectral sketches that need smaller space, n polylog n over epsilon. Okay, smaller in terms of epsilon. Right, and this is really surprising given the lower bounds previously. Right, like that. I mean, sure, it's it's of course not the it's a weaker definition. That's the only way you can get something. But the fact that you can actually beat that epsilon squared is very surprising. Especially once you start thinking of Chernoff bonds. Chernoff bonds always need epsilon squared dependencies. Okay, so but they leave like an important question open: like, why is this a data structure? Do there exist graphs? Do there exist distribution over graphs that will give you? Uh, this proper probability, this property with high probability, right? They leave this question open, and we show that actually we can construct sparse graphical spectral sketches, right? So what's so just to formalize, what's the definition of a graphical epsilon spectral sketch? Now it's a distribution of our graphs such that for every x with high probability, you preserve this quadratic form. Up to one plus minus epsilon. Good. So, and we show that in fact every graph has a graphical epsilon spectral sketch with n poly log n over epsilon edges. Okay. So, how do we prove this? We prove this via short cycle decomposition. Let me address one of the points that you were asking before. Why do I care about this epsilon? In fact, in the results that we achieve, we lose many poly logs in order to save an epsilon. So why do you actually care? Uh, well, I will give you something more than the obvious answer. Oh, it's natural. <laughs> uh, so the there are actually applications where we care about subpolynomial epsilon. In particular, the most interesting one to me is uh, estimating the determinant of a Laplacian, uh, or equivalently, the number of spanning trees in uh, in a graph. And there, the epsilon you need to pick is like n to the minus one over four. So, in, so our result turns out to be actually a key component in in a result I won't talk about, which is uh, for estimating the determinant up to one plus minus epsilon. We give the first subquadratic algorithm uh, to be able to do this. Okay, so we really do care about this epsilon dependency, or at least there are applications we care about, particular applications we care. About. So let me show you how, uh, like at a high level, of how do we achieve this using short cycle decomposition. So I'm really running out of time. I didn't expect that, but let's. So here's uh, so here's what they did, uh, Jambalopati Sirfar. I'm going to give you like a bird's eye view of their algorithm. They use something a uh, uh, hammer that is called expanded decomposition. We will use the same hammer. Uh, think of it as follows: It partitions a constant fraction of the edges in your graph into expanders. It's not exactly correct, but let's pretend this is what it is, right? Uh, about half the edges in the graph, you partition it into expanders. So here's the al algorithm by Jambalopati Sitford. They recursively use expanded decomposition to write the entire graph as a union of expanders. Right? You take the remaining edges and you recurse. Then they do the following. So now you've reduced the problem to sampling over expanders. Over an expander, you randomly uniformly sample a sparse graph. 
Okay, you have to pick the probabilities well, but you will sample a sparse graph. From this sparse graph, what would have been natural is to write the Laplacian of the sparse graph. Turns out that does not work. What they need to do is that you compute the quadratic form with a slightly different matrix, which is the degree of the original graph minus the weighted adjacency matrix of the sample graph. Okay? And since these degrees are not, the degree of the original graph is not the same as the degree of the sample graph, this is not the Laplacian of the sample graph. But it turns out this works to give you a spectral sketch. But I hope this tells you what we should try. Right? It is about preserving the degrees exactly. Right? So, so we try what is immediately suggested that you use the same approach, you recursively use expanded decomposition to reduce the problem to expanders. Now, on expanders, rather than sampling independent uh, the edges independently, you do degree preserving sampling. Right? I mean, I say sparsification, which is essentially the same procedure, but it is not the same proof, like it does not follow from sparsification. You do the same correlated sampling to preserve the weighted degrees exactly. Ah, good. So, so here's an easy way to think about it. So, just think of the complete graph, right? Think of a vertex cut, right? So, we want to get n over epsilon edges, or n polylogon. So, if I want to get n over epsilon edges at a single vertex, if I independently sample edges, I'm going to get a variance of one over root epsilon. So, there will be vertices that have that have degrees that are off by a 1 plus minus root epsilon and that is too bad, right? We cannot afford that. So, I can see why you want to. So, vertex cut you need to pay special attention. That is right. What about for like balls of radius for any? Ah, it turns out, right, right, right. It turns out in expanders it is enough because in expanders you quickly, you really do not have any. There are no other small cuts in some sense, right? Or, or think of it this way: if we, if it's a, if it's a tree of one, one degree, one over epsilon, now you suddenly have one over epsilon squared. You have a lot to play with, and you can afford a square root of one by epsilon squared error, right? So, so it's only the degree cuts that matter in the expanders. Okay. And it turns out we can kind of make this sketch really work. Uh, this, uh, this sketch really gives you uh, epsilon graphical spectral sketches where n poly log n over epsilon h. Okay? Good. So, let me quickly skip this. We are kind of running out of time. So, th uh, there was this notion introduced by Denise Krautkammer and Wagner that talked of preserving just effective resistances rather than preserving everything else. And it it's it was known that spectral sparsifiers are resistance uh, sparsifiers, but with n over epsilon squared edges. And then it's Krautgammer Wagner. They showed that actually expanders have something better. They have resistance sparsifiers with n over epsilon polylog n edges, and they conjectured this is true for all graphs. Uh, we actually we settle that conjecture and we show that our spectral sketches are actually also resistance parts. I will skip this proof. I mean, I kind of just a key lemma, but we show that uh, the same construction that I showed you before. Spectral sketches they give you they preserve all effective resistances up to one plus minus epsilon without requiring n over epsilon squared edges, right? Only requiring n over epsilon polylog n edge. Ah, but only n squared vectors, right? Right. So that you can get by union block because it's a with high probability statement. Oh, I see. The probability is, is small enough. Uh, yeah, the, it's the it's polynomial large polynomially small, so I can take a union bound over n squared. Okay. But the challenge here, the challenge is that I don't want to preserve the quadratic form with the Laplacian. I want to preserve the quadratic form with the inverse of the Laplacian, and that's not obvious. Right? Because in spectral specification, you can go from uh, preserving spectrally the matrix to the inverse, but when you are preserving only the quadratic form with high probability, that's, that does not translate immediately. 
this needs work. Right? Uh, but I will skip that in order to give you some idea of how to how to actually compute these this, uh, decompositions fast. Okay? So, this is based on uh, the our follow up soda paper, which is much easier than the one we wrote uh, previously. So, so, the naive algorithm I showed you as an existence proof gives you cycle lengths of roughly log n. I am ignoring constants here. Cycle lengths of log n leaves linear number of edges, but it requires a running time that is quadratic. Right? We had a much more complicated algorithm that gave you almost linear time n to the little o of one cycle length and almost linear remaining edges. But I will show you something that is much easier to parse, much easier to present that does the following. For every integer c, so think of c as the number of re the recursion depth that you will pick. I get cycles of length log n to the constant and I pay a running time that is edges times vertices to the 1 over c. Okay? So, if I pick c to be square root log n, then I roughly get uh, an algorithm that gives you runs in almost linear time m times sub polynomial and gives you cycle lengths of sub polynomial leaving only a linear number of edges. Oh, I am missing something. <laughs> Sorry, thanks. There is like a 2 to the c, 2 to the order c parameter here. Oh, in the cycle length, there is a 2 to the c. Yeah. Why? No, no, sir. Because if the graph has a little, a little bit of girth, how can you get cycle length? I am allowed to throw out some edges, and that is the key point, right? Because otherwise, if I pick just a big long cycle of length n, I can never find short cycles. I am allowed to throw out a few edges, right? That is always crucial in a short cycle decomposition, right? Otherwise, you are forced to uh, pick long cycles, right? So, throwing out a linear number of edges, the proof showed that actually everything else can be written as short cycles. Okay? So, I will give you a quick idea as to how do you construct this recursive algorithm. If you have seen uh, construction of low stretch spanning trees by Alain Karpeleg and West, this is very similar, but if you have not, I will show you what is the key idea. So, so the first thing that is kind of easy and I will kind of skip the proof is that you can reduce the problem to solving short cycle decomposition on a sparse bounded degree graph. Okay? This is very easy, we will just pick a subset of the edges from the original graph you know let us say I have written the proof here. So, you const you just pick the first 20 edges from every vertex. So, now it is a sparse graph, but you might have high degree and you split the vertices of high degree in order to have small degree. Right? If I had degree 80, I will split it into two vertices of degree 40. So, now I have a sparse bounded degree graph, but the key point is that if you find a cycle in the sparse bounded degree graph, I know how to translate it back to a cycle in the original graph. Right? Very easy mapping. Uh, and then uh, and you can remove the cycles and now you repeat with another sparse graph. Good. So, it suffices to solve the problem on sparse boundary degree graphs and that is what I will show you how to do. So, sorry there, there are more things here than I am able to cover, but let me tell you the main idea. The main idea is we are going to recurse via contraction. Okay? So, what are we going to do? So, let us say here is my original graph. I am going to identify parts of this graph that are sort of a fixed size, which is a contraction factor roughly n, think of it as n to the 1 by c. right? So, polynomially large, but not all of it. And we will ensure that they have low diameter, each of these pieces have low diameter. You take such pieces, and now you contract them into single vertices. right? And once you contract them, you get these, get a smaller graph. We will recurse on this smaller graph. Right? So, you find a short cycle decomposition here. Once you have a short cycle here, say this black cycle, I know how to translate it back into these edges on the original graph. And given the fact that these pieces had small diameter, I can now connect these endpoints in order to complete it into a cycle that is not much longer. Good? Okay. So, 
So then here's a description of the algorithm. I will fix a reduction factor. A reduction factor is polynomial, right? n to the 1 over c. c is your number. Think of c as the number of levels of recursion you want to go to. Then I will partition my graph into pieces, each that has a low diameter, log n. And think of each of them as exactly having size k, right? I will think of them as exactly having size k. Then what I can do is I can contract each of these components into a single vertex, right? So now my graph is much smaller, right? It's n over k in size, and I will recurse on this much smaller graph. You find a short cycle decomposition, you lift it back, and you expand it using the fact that these pieces had low diameter. Okay, so so this choice of the constant ensures c levels of recursion. And because each of these pieces had a log n length diameter, my length sort of increases by a multiplicative factor of log n at every <coughs> step. So I will get a cycle length of log n to the c. Right? Uh, I will skip one par later part, but the one key point here is why can you actually partition the graph into these pieces with small diameter? It's a classic idea called region growing due to Leighton and Rao, and the proof is kind of very simple. Uh, the proof just says pick an arbitrary vertex, you start growing, you start growing the BFS tree around this vertex until you find a cut of low conductance. Right? If you don't find a cut of low conductance, then like I'm look, I look for constant conductance. If you're looking for constant conductance, if you don't find a low conductance cut, then I will cover the entire graph in log n, in uh, log n depth. Right, so 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 just doing this BFS growing and low conductance cuts gives you a proof that for any so think of beta as constant, one over hundred. You can remove a constant fraction of the edges, m over hundred edges, and obtain and such that all the remaining components have diameter that's like constant log n. Right, so we will remove a constant fraction. Now you've got log n component diameters, right? But what did I say previously? I said I wanted to partition into pieces with diameter log n and roughly k vertices, right? So there's one small step remaining that some of these pieces might be too large, okay? And that's kind of easy to handle. If the pieces are too large, I'm just going to sort of chop up the, you take the low diameter tree and you chop up the the you the tree so that none of these pieces are too big. And we have to exploit the fact that it's a constant degree graph. If it's not a constant degree graph, think of a star, right? Star is lower diameter. It's very hard to divide up a star into pieces that have, say, size, size is root n, right? It can either be a constant or it's everything. So in order to do that, we have to really use the fact that we're working with bounded degree graphs. Okay, so three key pieces. We will do recursively contract pieces that are largish, polynomially large, but small diameter. You could contract them, you recurse, and you lift it back, right? And you do you do it with the right parameters, and you get uh, you get the following main theorem that for any graph with m edges and n vertices, we run in the following time. So c is any constant. That's a, your depth of the recursion edges times vertices to the 1 over c, you also have a, like a constant 2 to the c factor, right? Uh, and this gives you cycles of length log n to the c, poly log n, with only linear number of edges, not in the cycles. Okay, so there has been follow-up work that improves on this sketch that I showed you, and it gives, instead, so in fact, I can tell you where it is. So we have cycles that increase like log n to the c. They have cycles that increase like two to the c. That gives you like uh, that gives you a slightly better results. Uh, but here's a question that's still open: Give me an algorithm that runs in m poly log n time and decomposes the graph into cycles of length poly log n. You are allowed to throw away n to the one plus little o one edges, right? Not even n poly log n. A little more than that. But 
your running time poly, poly, polylog m times polylog and the cycle length being polylog i do not know how to do this ok good. So, let me quickly just conclude. So, what did I present? I have which talked of a new decomposition short cycle decomposition uh, that gives us several applications in graph specification degree preserving specifiers, graphical spectral sketches and effective resistance specifiers and I showed you an easy algorithm to construct this efficiently. What I did not cover there are many other results in the paper uh, you can use this to specify Eulerian graphs directed Eulerian graphs this is a new notion that has come up recently. Uh, and before our algorithm all the proofs went through expanded decomposition. Now, you need something much weaker which is this short cycle decomposition and we get much better parameters. We can also use this for faster algorithms for estimating all pairs effective resistances which is again used in order to estimate the determinant uh, ok, but I skipped all of that in the interest of time and I will end with that. Thank you.